Romans chapter 3, and we'll, of course, stand for the reading of God's word. Our text this morning is Romans 3, 23. And I will start reading at verse number 9. Thank you. Romans chapter 3, I'll start reading at verse number 9. What then are we better than they? No, in no wise, for we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They're all gone out of the way. They're together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace they have, have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. We're looking at great texts of the Bible. And this morning, we're looking at Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Let's pray. Our Father, thank you, Lord, for this passage of Scripture that we're looking at this morning that points us, Lord, to our sinfulness, but also reminds us of the remedy for our sin, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, as we consider this text before us today, I pray that you open up our hearts to understand it, open up our hearts to receive it, Lord. And if there's someone that doesn't know the Lord as their Savior, I pray that that one will be saved today. Help us, Lord, to to apply these truths to our hearts and lives. Fill us with your spirit. I pray the spirit will work in each one of us according to each need. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Please be seated. There were four preachers who were getting together for a friendly gathering, I guess. And during the conversation, one of the preachers said to the other ones, now listen, our people, they always come to us and they tell us what's on their heart and they tell us what's going wrong or what's going right. And you know, confession is good for the soul. Let's, 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 let's talk to each other about the things that we're struggling with, the things that we face. And so uh, they have this conversation, and one of them says, well, I, I guess I, I, I'll go first. I, I struggle with my temper. I, I lose my temper, and that's not good. And said, okay. And one of them said, well, I, I guess I should go too. I, I, I like to smoke cigars, he said. I I think that's okay, and that's something I struggle with. The third one said, well, you know, I like golf a lot. I like golf so much that sometimes I actually fake sick on Sunday, and I go golfing. And the fourth one said, they said, well, what's yours? He said, I can't tell you. No, seriously, what's yours? No, 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 I don't want to tell you. Finally, they pressed me and said, my sin is gossip. And boy, oh boy, I can't wait to get out of here. <laughs> I hope that's not a true story. But anyway, <laughs> your preacher is not like those preachers, okay? <laughs> but it does remind us of a truth this morning, doesn't it? No matter who it is, whether it's the preacher or whether it's the one in the pew or whether it's the one outside of the church, the Bible says all have sinned. 
For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You know, this is a verse that I have known all my life. This is the second verse that I ever memorized. When I was a kid, the first one I memorized was John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That was the first verse I memorized. And the second one was Romans 3, 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It's a familiar verse, but I don't think it's a popular verse. I don't believe it's a verse that people get excited about like they do John 3.16. But, you know, it's a great text of the Bible. It's a great verse. It's, in fact, it's the beginning text of what we call the Romans road. It's the text where it all begins for us. When we walk the road of salvation, we must begin with Romans 3.23 and realize that we are sinners. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Jesus Christ came into this world to save sinners. He didn't come to save good people. He came to save sinners of whom I am chief. And this morning we consider the truth for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. When we consider this verse this morning, I want you to see number one, that it is a pointed statement. It's a pointed statement. This one hurts. You know, this isn't what we want to hear. This great text of the Bible, it, it steps on our toes. It's like someone jabbing you with a spear. It's like somebody sticking you with a sword. It's a pointed statement because it points at you and me, and it, it tells us something that we don't want to admit. It tells us something that even if we are willing to admit it, we don't want other people to know that about us, okay? <laughs> don't tell my wife this verse. <laughs> don't tell her that I'm a sinner. Don't tell my children this verse. I don't want them to know. It's a pointed statement. You know, we live in a day where men don't want to be called a sinner. Don't, don't say that I'm a sinner. Don't say that I've sinned. Don't say that I've done wrong, that I have done something against God. Don't tell me about my sin. Don't call me a sinner. That's why the world gets so upset today. Gets so upset is because they, with Christianity, because they realize that Christianity tells a standard of right and wrong. The Bible tells us what's right. The Bible tells us what's wrong. And to disobey the Bible, to disobey God is sin. And people don't want to admit that they're a sinner. They'd rather be called something else. Uh, there's a two men, a, a man was preaching this text, Romans chapter three, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. He said, start, starting in verse 22, for there is no difference. And this man was listening to his preacher and he said, I don't like what you're preaching. He said, I have a problem with that text. He said, do you mean to say that there's not a difference between an honest man and a dishonest man, between an intemperate man and a sober man? You mean there's no difference between the two? The preacher said, no, no, I, there's room for a comparison between the two. But what I would say, if I see those two men standing together, I'd say now there's an, uh, I, I should say of one of them, now there's an honest sinner and there's a dishonest sinner. There's an intemperate sinner and there's a sober sinner. They'd still be sinners. The friend didn't know what to say about that. He said, oh, I don't like that. The preacher said, well, I'll, I'll give you this. Some might be superior sinners. <laughs> superior, but they're still sinners. You know, we just rather not use the word sinner at all. <laughs> we'd rather just get, take our dictionary. We'd rather take a permanent marker and we'd rather blot that word out. <laughs> Call it something else. Call me something else. You know, nobody's perfect, we say. We'd say, well, everybody's human. Everybody makes mistakes. But don't call me a sinner. Don't say that I'm a sinner. But the Bible doesn't beat around the bush, does it? The Bible doesn't sugarcoat the message. The Bible is a two-edged sword. It cuts and slices the soul. It's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And it gets straight to the point. And our text isn't beating around the bush. It's including all of us in the statement. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It's a pointed statement. 
But you know what else it is? It's a proven statement. A proven statement. To make a statement like that, you got to be able to back it up, don't you? <laughs> Hey, I mean, we're good people. We, we do the best we can. We, we keep the law. We, we've never harmed anybody. We're honorable citizens. How can you dare point the finger at me, you say, and, and say that I'm a sinner? We're good people. We're not like everybody else. Perhaps that's you today. You know, you say, Pastor Luke, you know, I, I'm a good person. I mean, I know I'm not perfect, but I'm a good person. If you compare me with other people, I come out pretty good. I, I, I'm not, I, I'm maybe not a saint, but I'm certainly not a sinner. Well, you know, we can all say we're a saint compared to somebody else. There's a story of this two crooks. They were brothers and they just ran havoc all over their community and did lots of crimes and stole from a lot of people and hurt a lot of people. And, but one of the days, one day came where one of the brothers died. And the surviving brother wanted to give him a funeral that was fit for the king. He called the funeral home, made all the arrangements, and had all these things set up for a grand funeral. And then he called the minister and said, will you do my brother's funeral? He said, I'll give you $10,000 to put a new roof on your church if you will say in your funeral service that my brother was a saint. The preacher agreed. He said, okay, I'll do that. And so I don't, uh, the preacher it comes to the service, and he's speaking about the man, and he said, the man you see in the coffin was a vile and debauched individual. He was a liar, a thief, a deceiver, a manipulator, a reprobate, a hedonist. He destroyed the fortunes, careers, and lives of countless people in this city, some of whom are here today. This man did every dirty, rotten thing you can think of. But compared to his brother, he was a saint. <laughs> compared to his brother, he was a good guy. You know, compared to others, you say, I'm not a sinner. Compared to other people, I don't look at the person you're sitting next to and say, hey, compared to him, compared to my husband and my wife, compared to my children, you know, I'm not a sinner. No, 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 no. It's not compared to others. It's compared to the word of God. The Bible doesn't say, now let's just line up all the people and we'll We'll say, okay, we'll say so many people are good. Compared, if you're better than this guy, then you're, then you're okay. No, the Bible holds up the standard of the glory of God. It holds up the standard of the Bible. It holds up the standard of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it measures us to have come up short. You see, what we don't realize is Romans chapter 3 is talking to people that were good people. It's a chapter that's written for people that say, now listen, Paul, listen, listen, Lord, I, I keep the law. You don't you know what kind of person I am? I am a descendant of Abraham. I am someone that has done good my whole life. I, have, I am someone that has always had a form of worshiping God. I have someone that has done my best to keep all the laws and the statutes and the commandments. I am a good person. Certainly, I am better than the rest. Certainly, I'm not included in that statement. All have sinned. Certainly, that's not me. And this chapter says, well, that's what you think. But why don't you look at what the Bible says? It's not what we think. It's not my opinion. It's what does God say in his word? And in Romans chapter 3, verse 9, it says, What then are we better than they? No one, no wise, for we have before proved. It's proven, both Jews and Gentiles, that they are all under sin. The Jew says, but I've kept the law. Well, verse 10 says, well, do you know what the law says? As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Verse 10 starts a sequence there. Verse 10 says, as it is written. Verse 10, all the way down to verse 18. Do you know what it is? It's quotations from the Old Testament. This is what the Bible says. This is what the law says. The law that you're holding up and you're saying, I have kept this law. This law means that I am, that I'm innocent, that I am not a sinner. God says, no, no, no. That law, it declares that you are a sinner. It shows your sin. As verse 20 says, by the law is the knowledge of sin. What does the Bible say about us? It says there is none righteous. No, not one. 
those that are looking at the law and saying, I'm righteous, I'm justified by the law. The same law looked back at them and said, no, you're not righteous. There's none righteous. That same law said, there is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. That same law that they looked to to claim that they were on the right way, that they were headed home. The same law that they looked to to say that they were good, looked back at them and said, they're all gone out of the way. They're together become unprofitable. There is none that do with good. No, not one. We look at the next person and we consider ourselves to be in pretty good standing. We compare ourselves to others and we say, I'm good. You know, we're going out on the street, passing out tracks starting Tuesday night. And you know what response we get a lot of time? I'm good. Would you like an invitation to church? Would you like some good news from the Bible? I'm good. The Bible says there is none that do with good. No, not one. We think we're good. The Bible looks back at us and says, no, their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues, they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. <laughs> People say they're not sinners, but have you ever listened to how they talk? Have you ever listened to the words that come out of their mouth? The words that come out of our mouths have proven the point that we are sinners. An open sepulcher, a, a tomb. A, uh. Back when I lived next door, and I'd come through the back entrance to the church. I had been on vacation. I came back, and I was coming over to print the bulletin. And I opened the door, and there was a foul stench. I thought, oh, boy, that's, that's great. Something died somewhere. Anyways. Rosalie's leading the way. She's going to walk up the stairs and she just stops dead in her tracks. And I'm like, Rosie, just keep going. Why did you stop? I almost tripped over her, you know. But right in front of her was the, I don't want to tell you. I want you to come back next week. But uh, down in the basement that we don't use, in the cellar part of the church, there is a cellar part. There was a dead rat. And it just stank. And it was just, oh. And uh, God says, that's what our throats are like. That's what God compares the words that man speaks. You know, we have a tendency. It starts as a child, doesn't it? A tendency to complain. A tendency to use our mouths to speak bad of others. Uh, we, 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 with our tongues, we have spoken deceit. With our tongues, we have spoken words of bitterness, words of cursing with our tongues. That's our speech. We've proven with our speech the poison of asps is under their lips. That's describing, man, I, that's a pretty accurate description, is it not? Now, I, I grew up in a Christian home. I, I, there are some words that, praise the Lord, I haven't said, and yet at the same time, these verses point to me, and they remind me that I'm a sinner. They remind me that I have sinned and come short of the glory of God. This verse is the catch-all. There's not one person that can look at this verse and say, well, that's not me. I have always spoken good things. I have never used my tongue in a wrong fashion. I've never sinned with my mouth. No. All these verses. It might not have done all the things on the list, but, you know, this is a description of men. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. That's a description of people. That's a description of us. And the text is telling us, you, you say you're, you're innocent, but you just, just stop. Stop. You've proven it with your actions. The Bible has come out and said it. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You say, but I am not like other people, Pastor Luke. I, I, I personally haven't done what they've done. I, I'm not the one that's on death's row. I'm not the one that's committed certain crimes. I, I'm not this person. Yes, but you've still fallen short. Maybe you, maybe you were a little closer to the standard than somebody else, but you still fell short. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Sin means to miss the mark. Sin means to come short of the divine standard. And we've all come short. 
I'm told that in London to be a guard that, I don't know if it's still this case, but to be one of those guards, you know, that just stands still and protects the queen. <laughs> you have to be six feet tall. Now they have them at, up at uh, Citadel Hill and they have them different places. And I always like to make them, try to make them laugh. I think I've seen one of them smile, but uh, you gotta be a pretty, uh, pretty miserable person to have that job because <laughs> you can't seem to make these guys smile. But anyways, to be that guard, you have to be at least six feet tall. And two men were applying for it. And uh, one of them was five foot seven. He didn't get the job. He was, he knew his stuff, but he wasn't tall enough. The other one though, well, he was the son of a guardsman. You know, he, he was someone that knew everything that was supposed to be done. He was someone that had practiced the drills. He knew, he knew everything, all that job inside out. And he was 5'11 and a half. You know what? He still fell short. They didn't give him the job. They said, no, you're too short. And that's sin. Sin is a coming short. We say from our perspective, I'm a lot closer than this person. I've come a lot closer to the standard. Yes, but you've still fallen short. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It's a proven statement. It's a pointed statement. But you know, praise the Lord. It's a profitable statement. I'm so thankful that this is in the Bible because it tells me that I need to be saved and ultimately points me to the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. You might not have wanted to come to church this morning and hear the pastor preach the most popular sermon topic in the world. You're a sinner. You maybe didn't want to hear that today, but you need to know it. You need to know what the Bible says. It's profitable for your soul. Romans 3.23, this is the text that if someone is raising their hand and they want to come forward and trust the Lord as their savior, I start here. Romans 3.23, and I say, listen, did you know this about yourself? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's where it starts. The ver Why did Jesus come into this world? It's our memory verse this month. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Have you ever realized that you're the sinner that Jesus came to save? Romans is a great book, and this book is written to declare the gospel. And the theme of the opening chapters is this. You can't save yourself. The only way you can be saved is by the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why Paul says at the very beginning, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. This whole, this whole portion of the scriptures is proving that you can't get saved any other way. You say, well, I, I can get saved by doing the best I can. No, you can't. You say, well, I do better than others. If I, if I just do better than others, no, you can't. You say, well, maybe when I get to the end of my life, I'll stand before God and he'll measure my good deeds and my bad deeds and he'll weigh them in the balance. And if I've done more good than bad, then I can be saved by my, no, you can't. The only way you can be saved is by the Lord Jesus Christ, by putting your faith and trust in him. Why? Because you're a sinner because you've fallen short. You've sinned and come short of the glory of God. Even in your best, all our righteousness, the Bible says, is as filthy rags, or all together as an unclean thing. There is none that do with good, no, not one. And this text is written to prove to us, to show us that we can have salvation, but it's not by our works. It's by putting on the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Romans 3.23 is the subject of our text this morning. That's what we're preaching on. You know, I'm not an English teacher. My, my older brother is an English teacher, but 
Uh, I don't teach English, but I can tell you this. Romans 3.23 isn't even a whole sentence. It doesn't end with a period. In fact, if you read the whole sentence, Romans 3.23 is really just a parenthetical thought. Uh, it's just a, it's just a, it's, a, it's giving the reason why we need the righteousness of Christ. These verses are written so that we see that the only way to be saved is through the righteousness of God by putting our faith and trust and the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 21, but now the righteousness of God without the law, not by works, is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's a parenthetical thought to the thought that's being preached being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation. That's a, a sacrifice to, for our sins, uh, through, to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness, not our righteousness, his righteousness for the sin, remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Jesus came into this world to save sinners of whom I am chief. There is no other way. Don't you realize that if there was another way, then we never have heard of Calvary's tree. If there was another way, then why would God the Father give his only son to die the death that he died. Why would he send Jesus into this world to, to wear that crown of thorns, to, to take that scourging on his back, to carry that cross of Calvary's hill, to take the nails through his hands and his feet and the spear, the spear through his side? Why would Jesus have died on the cross if it weren't for the fact that there was no other way? There was no other way for us to be saved. What is the gospel? The gospel is the good news. This is the gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, 3, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. It's a profitable statement because it tells us that we must be saved. You know, the Bible tells us of the horrible consequences of sin, Romans 6, 23, but for the wages of sin is death. It's speaking of place of torment, the lake of fire, the place called hell. It's by, the Bible speaks of the dead, small and great. Those that receive the wages of sin, death, wrote Revelation 20. The dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books are open, and they're judged according to their works. But all have sinned. And so on that day, we see the dead, small and great, cast into the lake of fire. And the Bible tells us, though, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. And the only one who can save you is the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't save yourself. Someone else can't save you. Only Jesus can save you. And you say, God must not like me if I'm a sinner. God must not like us if, if he looks at us all and he says that uh, we've sinned and come short of the glory of God. No, that just magnifies his love. Romans 5, 8. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Just to paraphrase the quote that's in the bulletin this morning. That's what proves the greatness of God's love. If we could say that, you know, I earned his love. If we could say, well, there's something wonderful about us. If we could say that we weren't sinners and Jesus died for us. Well, that doesn't mean a whole lot if he gave himself for a good person. But it's the fact that he gave himself for sinners. It's the fact that he commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's what shows us the greatness of his love the magnitude of his love, the depths of his love, that there's not a person in this world 
that Jesus wouldn't come to save. But Romans chapter 3, verse 23 reminds us, you can't save yourself. The only way for you to be saved is through the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a pointed statement. It's a proven statement. It's a profitable statement. I wonder, have you come to Jesus to be saved today? There's a story of on Sunday, March 6, 1881. A ship was wrecked off the north coast of Scotland. And fishermen on the shore were making several attempts to get a line on board the ship, but the, but, but the wind was too strong. Finally, they tied the rope to a barrel, and they got the barrel to the boat, and they finally were able to set up a way to rescue the sailors one by one. They made some sort of, uh, what do they call it here, <clears throat> a traveling cage that they would send from the shore to the, pull on the pulley from the shore to the boat, and one by one, they could carry the sailors to safety. Well, they got the first one rescued, but then the wind was so strong, it blew the ship to a bad spot where they weren't able to operate their pulley anymore, their traveling cage, and couldn't get any more sailors off the boat. They knew they just needed to wait for the wind to stop, but one of the sailors said, no, 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 I can make it myself. He jumped into the water, and he tried to grab the rope and go from go pull his own way to safety. But it wasn't long until he had lost his grip and he sunk in the water. After that, the wind did bring the boat back to the right spot and they were able to rescue the rest of the sailors one by one. After it was over, the captain was asked about the sailor who had drowned. And he said, we tried to persuade him not to attempt such a useless task as it would be impossible for him to reach the shore in that way. But he would not listen to us. A fine fellow he was, the best man in the crew. But he was lost because he tried to save himself in his own way. And so it is for us today. You can't save yourself. The best of us can't. We're all sinners, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But the good news of the Bible is, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. He came to save you. Have you asked him to be your Lord and Savior? Our Father, thank you, Lord, for the text that's before us this morning. Lord, and such a sobering thought to consider that we've all sinned. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Lord, if there's someone here this morning that has never come to Jesus for salvation, They've never put their faith and trust in him. I pray that today will be their day of salvation. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.